seem much better than they do in the real world. So, can you continue? Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're all welcome um, this evening to the REACH um, expert panel um, for the Faces of Africa. REACH stands for Raising Awareness for the Crisis in the Horn of Africa. Um, many of you may have heard of um, the crisis, the food crisis, the humanitarian crisis, and human rights um, problems that um, had taken place in the crisis of in, in the Horn of Africa. And we thought that during the Faces of Africa Week for 2012, that we raise an awareness and talk about these issues. They are contemporary issues that affect um, humanity. And we are glad to have you all here. So without any further delay, um, may I firstly apologize for um, us commenting a few minutes late. But we are glad that we started and would um, get going. So we have um, a panel here today. We have our moderator here with us today and all of you here. So um, to introduce um, the moderator for the day, I want to invite a very special um, member of the team who put this together. And she also led the um, initiative, Raising Awareness for the Crisis in the Horn, the REACH initiative here in Johns Hopkins. I'm talking about um, Indu. So you're welcome, Indu. Thanks for coming. And um, most of us would recall seeing the distressed skeletal faces of children on our television screens and web pages during the recent Somali famine. Some of us would have felt the urge to make a donation to our trusted aid organization in a fervor to do something to ease the hunger. However, very few of us would have realized that there are many human-made causes of hunger and starvation. This evening's events are aimed at bridging the gap between perception and reality in Somalia. It is my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Professor Bob Lawrence, who has been the guiding force of this evening's event since its conception several months ago. Professor Lawrence is a founding director and professor of the Center for Believable Future at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. CLF is an interdisciplinary group of faculty and staff that focuses attention on equity, health, and the Earth's resources. Professor Lawrence is also the professor of health policy and management and international health. He is the recipient of the Sedgwick Award Medal for Distinguished Service in Public Health, the American Public Health Association's oldest and most prestigious award. The medal has been awarded since 1929 for distinguished service and advancement of public health knowledge and practice. Professor Lawrence co-founded the Physicians for Human Rights and has participated in human rights investigations on behalf of that group or others in Chile, previous Czechoslovakia, Egypt, El Salvador, Guatemala, Kosovo, the Philippines, and South Africa. We are deeply honored to have him moderate this important discussion on Somalia. So I'll, um, I'll invite Professor Bob Lawrence to now take the panel. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you very much, Indu. Um, for the clinicians in the audience, the panel sitting up here is all select, uh, experiencing right homonymous hemianopsia. So if for the non-clinicians in the audience, that means that we don't see anything in the right visual field. So those of you who are hunkered down way in the back, there are some wonderful tables right up here. And if this panel discussion is going to be interactive and truly engaging, then you ought to uh, come forward and take advantage of that. <clears throat> and I see four people in the back not moving yet. Now it's down to three. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Indu and Chine and the entire group who have worked so hard to organize uh, this week, focusing on the challenges of uh, health uh, in Africa and particularly the challenges of food security and uh, the dilemma of uh, uh, famine in the Horn of Africa. <clears throat> when Indu came to see me last fall at the height of the crisis, um, we talked about some of the people at Hopkins who have been 
directly involved, and I uh, mentioned um, Uni Kanukura, who got his DRPH at the school about seven years ago and is currently the uh, director of Medicine Sans Frontier. Uh, and Indu uh, suggested that maybe we could contact um, Uni and see if he could come uh, last fall to talk about the famine, particularly because a couple of MSF workers uh, had been killed uh, attempting to help with the crisis in Somalia uh, and eastern Kenya. And the particular challenges of responding in a humanitarian way uh, in the midst of a conflict zone, of course, stress uh, the resources of uh, NGOs and government-supported organizations far greater uh, than the uh, presence of a physical or a man-made catastrophe in an area that is not also uh, in the midst of armed struggle. In, <clears throat> Uni is going to be here next Tuesday. He couldn't be here this week because his travel plans uh, uh, from Africa and from Geneva, uh, but we all hope that uh, if you're free at noon on Tuesday that you will come to hear him reflect on what it has meant to MSF to attempt to respond uh, to this uh, famine emergency in the Horn of Africa uh, under those conditions. We have three wonderful people uh, here on the panel, and I'm going to uh, introduce them uh, individually as they uh, speak. We have about uh, 15 minutes for each of them to speak, and then we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but to set the stage for this discussion, I just want to go over a couple of uh, uh, facts that I'm sure are familiar to everybody in this room. The world population is now 7 billion people. Uh, we have uh, the best estimates that about a billion people are malnourished. Another 1.4 billion are either overweight or obese. And the problem of obesity is actually increasing more rapidly in middle-income countries than in any other part of the world. So we have these two polar extremes of inequitable access to a healthy uh, food system. One striking example of the one billion who are malnourished is the fact that Cambodia, <clears throat> still trying to recover, from the Pol Pot regime and the Khmer Rouge, it's estimated that 60% of children in Cambodia are both nutritionally and cognitively stunted, meaning that they have had such inadequate access to quality protein that their physical stature is permanently diminished, but even more tragically, their ability to think clearly, to learn, and to be effective citizens is compromised. We don't have comparable data from uh, the Horn of Africa, but uh, I think it's fair to extrapolate from the Cambodian data to say that the children who are barely surviving, the lack of quality protein and the general lack of caloric intake uh, in Somalia, eastern uh, Kenya, and parts of Ethiopia will also face those same lifelong challenges. In an analysis of the global food supply <clears throat> done by the late Norman Borlaug, who won the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the um, development of high-yielding uh, wheat varieties in Mexico that led to the first Green Revolution, he was asked to look at the carrying capacity of the globe. Uh, and his estimate, based on very reliable data, uh, was that we had enough food at the time of his analysis and projecting forward to a population of 7 billion. We have enough food today in the world to feed 9 billion people if the diet were predominantly grain, fruits, and vegetables, and if it were equitably distributed. If everyone tried to eat the way we eat in North America, uh, where we derive 65% of our protein intake from animal products, uh, there would only be enough food to feed about 4 billion. 
So if you think about 7 billion people living in the world today, 1 billion malnourished, so that takes us down to 6 billion who are having access to adequate amounts of food, another billion and a half who are overweight or obese, that takes us down to 4.5 billion who are in harmony with their caloric nutritional needs and with the access to a healthy food system. So we are really in a rather dire uh, set of circumstances where the worst situations, such as the Horn of Africa, the most marginalized people in the world are suffering from a combination of inequitable distribution of existing foodstuffs, availability of the wrong kind of foodstuffs, uh, and a failure of uh, political and economic systems uh, to enable a sustainable local uh, food production system. So these are huge challenges. And the people that we're going to uh, hear from now have been working at different aspects of this and have a different perspective. And I look forward to a very rich discussion and hope that all of you will be engaged in uh, asking questions and commenting after we hear from them. Um, I'm going to start with Steve Hanch, who's on my right. Steve has been an adjunct faculty member uh, at Johns Hopkins uh, in international health as long as I've been on the faculty. We just learned uh, going back to the mid-90s. Uh, he has worked uh, with many different uh, NGOs uh, and is on the board of uh, uh, DARA. And he's going to uh, share with us his uh, perspective of the role of uh, the NGO community in responding to uh, humanitarian crises such as the one unfolding in the Horn of Africa. Steve? Oh, you're gonna, okay. Steve's going to show some slides, so uh, he'll speak from the podium. I usually like to walk around, not so much because I like to walk around, but I find that it keeps people feeling like it's more three-dimensional and interactive. Um, there's, there's a kind of a narrative to what I'm talking about here, um, and it may not be that apparent at first. So what may be the best thing that the U.S. government has ever funded is something called the Family Warning System, which got started after the famines of the mid-80s, uh, Sahel, Sudan, Ethiopia. It's called FUSE, and the area of the world where it's got the most oomph is Somalia. Uh, that's partly because there's not much else a lot of our agencies are able to do in Somalia. Uh, it's a kind of a tractable country. It's a country that formerly was an Italian colony, so <laughs> Italy takes a lot of interest in the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, a UN agency in Rome. And so FAO has really stood up and done a great job of tracking famine in Somalia over the last few years. But the basic methodology has been published by the U.S. government, and it's still to this day, I think, the far and away the best example of applications of mapping in JS and satellite imagery for anything in humanitarian aid. There's a lot of initiatives uh, these days about using satellite imagery and using mapping and crowdsourcing and open street maps for humanitarian aid purposes. And it's not really clear that it's made that much of a difference, but the family warning system is all about getting ahead of the curve because almost all reviews of food aid for responding to needs over the decades have found that food aid is usually late and it misses the, the boat. And so FUSE was really all about getting us enough advanced warning that we can get ahead of the curve. So FUSE was the first initiative to use satellite imagery and NDVI, and then it mixed it with all kinds of ground data, such as rainfall, which you can collect within a cup, field observations of crops, but also key data that we've learned is really valuable, such as the price of food, and distress sales, which are lagging indicators, such as when people are selling off their assets, their land, their tools, and then forced, forcibly migrating. So through FUSE, NGOs, 
have learned to collect local food price data, and we've learned to anticipate food crises are largely defined, or let me put it another way, very highly correlated with the local retail price of grains. And we can usually predict food severity and malnutrition largely from the local pr price of grains. When the price of grains go up, uh, the price of other things often go down, uh, like livestock, and because the terms of trade flip. Live streaming? Oh, you mean they have to see me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because otherwise they won't be able to see me? <laughs> I'm really scared because I don't think I've ever been tweeted before. <laughs> and the, the notion that I'm being live tweeted, is, I just don't know what it means. Anyway, so, so uh, let's segue now to Somalia. So uh, going back in time, Somalia was a challenge to the international humanitarian community in the late 1970s because back in those days there was a large war between Somalia and Ethiopia leading to a lot of people fleeing into refugee camps that were largely based in Somalia. So starting around 1979, the aid community got heavily into the business, the donors, the U.S. government in particular, got heavily into the business of providing a lot of food to 750,000 Ethiopian refugees in Somalia. Somalia didn't have that big of a population, maybe five million. So to be feeding an extra million people made a big difference in the food market. Not to mention of which, that pretty quickly of those 750,000 refugees, most of them dissipated and went out and got jobs and weren't there anymore. So a lot of the food aid leaked into the market. So essentially, a lot of that emergency food aid went to Somalis. In addition to which, because Somalia was allied with the United States during the Cold War, um, where Ethiopia was allied with the Soviet Union, uh, we also gave a lot of food aid to the government of Somalia, a lot, every year, which also kind of addicted the country to food aid. Now, this is not a historical tidbit. I'm, I'm saying this for a reason, because all the current events of Somalia in the last few years are heavily dependent on that history. We started, because of the Cold War, dumping, or I shouldn't say dumping, putting a lot of food into Somalia for humanitarian aid relief. Then in 1992, where we think about 200,000 excess deaths occurred uh, during the 1992 famine, the crisis wasn't a war with Ethiopia. Uh, it was a drought, but compounded by the fact that uh, there had been a civil war, so the government of Somalia was overthrown. But in the process of overthrowing the government, the capital city of Mogadishu was shot up so fully that everybody cleared out. So no UN agency, no World Food Program, no. So the food aid program has been given to the refugees for years, was mostly implemented by CARE. And they couldn't act, work there. The war was so violent that everybody pulled out. One of the consequences of everyone pulling out me, me, was that we couldn't deliver food anymore. So <laughs> this is kind of the key chart. The way a lot of people remember the 1992 famine was, oh, we discovered a country in the world called Somalia that we'd never heard of before. Oh, we have the President of the United States talking about it. Oh, some journalists went there. Oh, they seem to be having a food problem. Oh, let's solve it by bringing a lot of food aid in. That's how almost everybody remembers it. What they don't remember was that what, what defined the famine, it was the one year that they didn't get food aid. And I would argue that it was the withdrawal of food aid that, to a large extent, um, put the population in jeopardy, because we, we had, in fact, addicted the, the economy. And that's not something I'm trying to make a big point out of. I'm just making an observation. Uh, I'm all in favor of giving food aid in large quantities to people who, who need it. And we do give food aid in large quantities to lots of Koreans, North Koreans, Zimbabweans, Ethiopians, and other countries around the world, year in, year out. And that's, that's my background. That's my job. And so I support it. But I also acknowledge that we have certain dilemmas in this industry, such as what do we do when we provide the food aid so reliably that the country and the economy depends on us. So there, in 1992, there was a lot of forced migration. A lot of people moved into Kenya, the Laboy camp in early 1992 in Ethiopia. And so this mass migration was one of the early indicators of the crisis. A lot of armed violence that later we think of as being segueing into piracy. But I always find it interesting how a public health person would explain what happened in Somalia in 1992 by saying, oh, there was malnutrition. That malnutrition led to food distress. That food distress drove 
violence. Whereas political people say, oh, no, no, the root cause was politics and violence, and the violence caused the malnutrition. Well, they're both kind of true. It was a vicious circle. I'm not going to uh, go into a lot, so much about the refugees, but we can talk about the interesting patterns of the long-term refugees in places like Dadaab today and Mandera. The big issue that I kept bringing up during that period, and this is profound because of the school here, was that nobody in 1992 was doing anything to anticipate a measles epidemic. Lo and behold, the main thing that killed maybe mm, two-fifths two, two of, of all the people who died during the famine was measles. And nobody would listen in a finger to immunize for measles because they couldn't establish a cold chain because they didn't have refrigerators. However, they could have given vitamin A. And if we'd given vitamin A, we know now, it would have reduced the case fatality rate so much that we could have maybe saved 100,000 lives at very low cost. But when I appealed to all the NGOs and the Centers for Disease Control at the time, why aren't you giving vitamin A out? Their answer was, oh, but it says in, the, in our book, in our manual, you give vitamin A when you do a measles immunization. And so my whole life has been sort of influenced by that recognition that people are often following rules rather than the rationale underneath the rules. Anyway, that's, that was the UNICEF rep at the time. The biggest operations were ICRC mounted 1,000 wet feeding programs and said they'll never do it again. They don't want anybody to know that they ever did it. ICRC rushes in <laughs> where, where they're needed the most. And why is ICRC so public health oriented? Because Pierre Perrin went to Johns Hopkins School of Public Health because Jim Kobe made him. Jim Kobe being a graduate of Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. <laughs> and so he influenced, Jim Kobe influenced the whole history of ICRC as a result of that. And the other thing that ICRC did throughout that famine period was immunize lots of cattle for rinderpest. A two big pronged intervention. Livestock for rinderpest because li livestock are vulnerable and wet feeding programs. This is not public record. They didn't want anybody to know that they had set up a thousand feeding centers because that's an extraordinary number for any agency to set up in any cri crisis. And they didn't want people relying on them to do it. So they said, they, they, they literally had a big retreat in Geneva afterwards and said, we're, we're absolutely never going to do this again. So I was very involved in trying to get an international response, both among NGOs, but also in the US government. And one of the key things that, that we know in retrospect actually made the difference in getting then President Bush to respond was a single CDC study that was done in Baidoa, one city, with one retrospective mortality survey, very similar to what CDC does and we all do now. Uh, we do <laughs> interviews to find out what happened within a household over the previous few months. And so the CDC study that found accrued mortality rates of around 30 deaths per 10,000 people per day among under fives was so high that that alone that uh, influenced the decision of the President of the United States to overrule every advisor he had, everybody in the Pentagon, everybody in the Department of State, none of whom wanted to go anywhere near Somalia. And the President said, no, this is a moral thing that we have to do. And so it was the first time the U.S. ever intervened militarily for a humanitarian purpose in Africa. And he did it because of epidemiology. What he didn't know, what we didn't know, what CDC didn't know, was the data point that they were using, which they kind of assumed was representative or average, wasn't. They, what CDC had done is had gone to the worst single place at the worst single time and done a survey that actually gave a very high estimate. Then later that year, U.S. ground troops arrived, and that's kind of history. That's what most people remember, a lot of U.S. ground troops fighting in Mogadishu and trying to <laughs> force aid on the people. But what people don't remember so much was that a lot of the aid that made the difference was just getting food onto the markets. In other words, the U.S. and Canada and WFP airlifted a huge amount of food partly because we couldn't do normal food distribution. We, a, NGOs uh, found it too insecure to set up the normal feeding centers that they like to do in other uh, crises. So we did a huge airlift. Sorry that my slides, I have, I have, I have more slides than, than, um, than I have time to explain all of them. So we did a large airlift in the fall of 1992. This is what shows the landing point. So we started from <laughs> Mombasa and Nairobi and had 30 flights a day on C-130 planes that just dumped a lot of food. So Somalia, because it's not that huge a population, was a country where airlifting actually could sort of make a difference, and we've gradually brought the price of food down because we just pushed, pushed that, uh, that tool so hard. And it brought the price of food down between September, October, November, December, so that by January of 1993, the famine was over. 
over both in terms of the price of food was brought back to equilibrium or normal, normal prices that people, poor people could afford, and in terms of excess mortality in both senses. So just the sheer airlift. This is prior to ground troops arriving, and for that matter, prior to most of the NGOs arriving. So the famine was kind of over by the time the international community responded. I spent a lot of my time during that period trying to orchestrate monetization, where it's a market intervention where we sell food into the market. And eventually, the heads of CARE, the heads of WFP, the heads of USAID all agreed that this is exactly the thing that was needed to use the market mechanism to put the food out there. Unfortunately, by the time we got around to monetizing the food, it was 1993 and the famine was over. And it was the right idea at the wrong time. Uh, so I have some slides about the, the wet feeding centers that have been set up. And I apologize again for going so fast through all that. This is a picture of the monetization where Somali wholesale merchants are coming and paying with Somali shillings for large shipments of food at the port in Mogadishu where they then take the food and move it inland where it gets radiated out through a whole bunch of different retailers. This is the excess mortality curve. Everything under the, under the curve represents excess deaths above normal. Um, in a normal period, we would expect maybe 99,000 or 90,000 deaths in Somalia. And so this is a curve that we were able to reconstruct from the data of NGOs, um, as well as some of our own surveys after the fact, that showed how the famine moved in two waves, partly re representing a rainy season, but partly representing also a geographic spread. So the first peak was more in the middle of Somalia, the second peak was more in the southern part of Somalia. And what the chart doesn't show is that a very large chunk of that death, of the mortality was from measles. CARE subsequently was kicked out, WFP has moved on, Lots of agencies are jockeying for all kinds of new ways to respond to famines, microfinance. When I was at, uh, interviewing all the NGOs at, working in Somalia three years ago, every single NGO was doing microfinance and market interventions of some sort. That's the big buzz now, as well as cash interventions and vouchers. And so there's a big debate in our community. So the ICRC, which is still in Somalia, even though they said they, they didn't want to be held to never do that again, they're doing it again. They are the dominant aid agency responding to the famine in this famine also. And they are responding with food because there's a net food shortage in Somalia in this last year in 2011. And uh, yet a lot of NGOs say, no, we live in a new era. We now know that food aid is bad and it's always better to give cash. And so there's just a huge rift in our community about how to interpret when to use different tools to save lives. I already mentioned the the missed opportunity to do a measles immunization of Somalia in 1992, we've had the same thing replay again this last year. So NGOs did not have access to southern Somalia. MSF and ICRC and Save the Children UNICEF were advised by Al-Shabaab, the rebel group that controlled most of the country, that they didn't want to see immunization programs. They also said they didn't want to see data collection. So we're actually in a weaker position now than we were 20 years ago in knowing what's happened. So in 1994, there was a cholera epidemic. I, this is a chart I showed of the, I, I drew up of the increase in cholera. We have every reason to believe that there was cholera in Somalia during this famine also, but we don't have a chart like this. We don't actually know where and when measles and cholera or any other forms of excess morbidity may have occurred. So we don't have a way to reconstruct the total number of deaths in this famine as well as we did in past crises. So MSF is restricted from doing community outreach. Most other agencies have been kicked out. Save the Children is hanging in there a little bit, but mostly the, the agencies that you hear working in Somalia are not really working in the famine zones, they're working in the edges around the famine zones, in places like Mogadishu and Hargeisa or in the refugee camps and sides. The key one is ICRC. ICRC, interestingly, has said that they will not call what just happened a famine. And the reason they say that is because they're not allowed to do a survey that is a true population-based survey with a good denominator. So they know that there's people suffering, but they don't know what the, they don't know how, what the actual rate is. And I think that's to their credit. In emergencies, we try to be more honest scientifically, but we don't pretend that because we see the occurrence of something that we can infer a lot about the rate of something from that. So <laughs> we're left with this dilemma in the current famine of what to infer from the appearance of some cases of problems among a self-selected population that has come into camps 
in Ethiopia and Kenya. And so Gilbert Burnham and I have been talking about a study that we were pitching to UNHCR and USAID to do a methodology that involves interviewing people about their siblings' households retrospective mortality experiences, not the family themselves who've led, but people who stayed behind in the famine zone. Um, similar to what Hopkins has done re repeatedly, mostly with Bert Robinson's leadership in uh, China among North Korean refugees. So again, the key concept here is we don't have access to population. We do have access to a weird self-selected group of people who fled the famine into other countries. And so to try to overcome or adjust possibly to that self-selection bias, we have a method whereby we ask those people who have fled and we have access to do interviews with, not about their household health outcomes, but about the health outcomes of their sister's family who are still back home in the famine zone. So if you're interested in being associated with this study, let me know. We can talk about it afterwards. I've been very frustrated with the Centers for Disease Control. Unlike 20 years ago, unlike 30 years ago, they have been involved, but they have a journal article where they've done their analysis in the, in the um, I think it was JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine or uh, Lancet, turned it down. And so it's not public, So and they won't release it. They won't tell us what they think about the study. So. Uh, there's a lot of the action is going on in Kenya as we already talked about. This is a, these are pictures of a NGO in Nairobi that takes care of women fleeing persecution. It's called Hashima. It was set up by a former student of mine. I'm on their board. Sorry, I'm going too fast. The FSNAU is the thing that I referred to at the very beginning. It's this special souped up family warning system that exists in Nairobi that has the Food and Agriculture Organization supporting or surrounding the USAID Fuse program. And they do a very in-depth analysis of famine. And so the, what you've heard a lot of people say probably is that this was a famine that we were warned about well in advance. So Oxfam and Save the Children came out with a report not too long ago saying we knew about this famine months in advance. And my main message to you is we knew about this famine years in advance. Why? Because of the US Congress passing legislation that says aid agencies are not allowed to look at, let alone talk to, let alone consort with anybody on a terrorist list. So that means that when Save the Children, which doesn't take any US money, US government money in Somalia, raises a dollar from a grandmother in Idaho to help in a famine zone in southern Somalia where El Shabaab is in control, Save the Children is committed a felony and the grandmother is committed a felony for having donated. And people, American citizens, have gone to jail here in this country in the last two years for sending their money into Shabab-controlled areas. Because of that concern, the U.S. government became schizophrenic. The Department of Treasury said, oh, we don't really care. USAID said, well, we've been giving food aid every year to Somalia, but we don't think we can anymore because we, individuals at USAID in Washington, will be liable for violating the Terrorism Act. So the Department of Treasury, which manages it, said, oh, don't worry about it. The lawyers at USAID said, we will worry about it because you're saying don't worry about it doesn't constitute a legal finding. So USAID shut off all food aid to Somalia three years ago, and predictably, the famine unfolded. And when I say predictably, I don't mean theoretically predictably. We were predicting it, and we were, we, the NGO community, were calling on the US government to fix, get their act together, to have the White House get the State Department and USAID and the Treasury all in the same room, and we've testified to Congress about this many times, and the U.S. Congress people and the senators say, oh yes, we never really meant this to be one of the unintended consequences of our tariff legislation, but they haven't fixed it. Um, so I want to move a little fast forward. So I've spent this last year all over again <laughs> meeting with the people down the street, Catholic Leave Services, meeting with World Vision, meeting with other NGOs saying, hey, at least we can work through the markets. Let's push food through the markets through the modernization program that we did 20 years ago. And once again, we did it. And it took months to get it off the ground, and the, food, the first food sales we got off the ground were this January after the peak of the famine was over, basically just as the new harvest was coming in. So it was the right idea, right place, right tool, but too late. So this is a chart that just came out last week from the family warning system. The red line is a funny, funny line. It shows uh, on their axis the probability over time 
that the future, the next few months, will become famine again. So in other words, just in the last few weeks, expectations about rainfall in Somalia have gotten just enough bad that all of a sudden they're predicting a much higher likelihood that we'll be returning into famine conditions again. Now, we didn't immunize in this crisis for rinderpest. Why? some of you in the room could tell me. Because we eradicated Rinderpest, probably the most important other event of the year 2011. It was the second disease in the history of the human race that we've declared as eradicated after smallpox. Um, so I'm going to sort of <laughs> zoom in now to the events of the last few weeks. So this is a meeting I was in in Mogadishu two weeks ago where we were meeting with the UN deputy resident coordinator about what to do with all the IDPs in Mogadishu and how we're trying to get NGOs like Norwegian Refugee Committee and or Council and IRC to, to help set up a bunch of new camps that will be longer term and aggregate them, which leads to a lot of the human rights NGOs that say, oh no, you're violating their human rights because you're, you're making people move when they don't want to move. So right now Mogadishu is safe in a very large way, in a way that it wasn't a year ago because the international community, which is say donors, have put in enough money to pay for Amazon, that's the AU Army, America, sorry, the African Union Army, working in Somalia, to beef up and have enough troops now that they can project their force and actually start winning against Al-Shabaab. So they're gradually retaking territory, and a lot of people are predicting, a lot of people have been saying that Al-Shabaab is finished, and that pretty soon the whole country will be liberated. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian Army is also invaded. And my work has been lately, not just on the food side, but or the public health side or the NGO side, but as the famine has been ending, I've been moving more into peace building. <coughs> I mentioned the Kenyan military invaded it last October. Soon afterwards, the Ethiopian military invaded, all on the side of Amazon, all on the side of the transitional government in Mogadishu against Al-Shabaab. So Al-Shabaab is getting hammered on all sides. And my job is to work with um, all of these parties to try and come up with a demobilization program that allows Al-Shabaab um, combatants who are by and large not ideological, who are by and large not um, in it for the long term, who are not in uniform, who haven't signed any agreement. They're just going along with Al-Shabaab because Al-Shabaab has intimidated them. To try and give them a path that they can follow to peace. So let me Zoom in. So I've been working with the transitional fellow government. This is the guy in the middle. This is a little bit of a um, serious guy. Is the defense minister of Somalia, and um, his family lives in Davis, California. And that's kind of typical of a lot of the um, about half of all of the key players in Somalia today are American. So th at, th at this meeting, this is a budget meeting. The guy who ran the meeting was the um, uh, the finance advisor for the mayor of Washington, D.C. Um, sorry. <laughs> so the goal is, can we buy peace? With the money that we're spending on humanitarian aid, for, a, for probably a fraction of it, we could, if we put that as an incentive program for people to demobilize, the Al-Shabaab rank and file people who aren't really ideological Al-Shabaab, in theory, will step down. And, and agree to a civilian life. But we have to create a pathway. So my job has been to anticipate and map the armed groups, create a governmental policy that everyone can buy into, that respects the international humanitarian law, that is transparent, that's fair, that it involves enough of a magnet that has some oversight. And so where we are right now, this month, is we're trying to hammer out standard operating procedures so that all of the different ministries of the government and the <coughs> UN agencies and UNICEF can all, all talk to each other and know how to refer people. So we're creating these flowcharts. And the main report for this was just submitted this morning, uh, about 7 a.m. before I drove up here from Washington. That's the Mogadishu Airport. This is the meeting on demobilization and reintegration that I chaired two weeks ago in Mogadishu. This is the resulting flowchart to create a comprehensive plan for where people can be reintegrated and get six months of food aid and different packages and a knowledge management system that tracks them so they can be protected, gives them ID cards so they can get cash. 
and I'm, we're trying to cap this all off with a conference in Washington, D.C. in a few weeks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve, for a comprehensive overview of the situation. Uh, we're now going to hear from uh, Sarad Sherdan, who's a doctoral student in education at Ohio State, uh, who currently works with uh, Save Somali Women and Children and End Famine, and has previously worked for UNESCO in Nairobi. Sarad? Hi, everybody. Um, that's a really tough act to follow. <laughs> um, I think my talk is going to be much more brief. Um, you know, not much data in my talk. I'm going to be speaking to the Somali responses um, and the, so the mobilization of Somalis following this famine. Um, and I wanted to begin with a quote, uh, to quote the Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Adichie, who gave... Is there any chance I could get that back again? Oh, Sensitive. sorry. Didn't. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> they want to webcast you and tweet you. Yeah. yeah. My apologies. Um, so I wanted to begin with a quote uh, by the novelist uh, Chimamanda Adichie, um, who's from Nigeria. She gave a wonderful TED Talks a couple of years ago um, about the single story. <laughs> um, the single story has been used to tell um, the story of the African continent over and over again, um, and specifically Somalia. Um, Somalia has been essentialized in the media as a, you know, country of despair, you know, r rife with terrorism, clanism, famine, you name it. And this single story has uh, trumped um, the amazing stories of hope, determination, res resilience, um, and unabated optimism which characterize uh, Somalis. Um, every day there are stories of hope and triumph related to Somalis in Somalia and the diaspora, yet these stories are never told. Uh, this brief talk is not meant to recap the specifics of the famine. Um, there's a lot of information out there for, on the web for those who are interested. Um, this talk is meant to highlight the Somali perspective and what Somalis in the diaspora did. Um, Somalis have for far too long been left out of important discussions, whether it relates to humanitarian development or politics. Um, it is quite a tragedy that policies and responses have, are being formulated to the various issues faced by Somalis without the inclusion of the most important stakeholders, Somalis themselves. Um, so just to begin, um, um, just talking about the early months of the famine, as a Somali community, we knew about the famine um, around August of 2010, which is when um, the FUSE um, predicted that there would be a famine in Somalia. Um, and if you ask any Somali, news of droughts are not uncommon. You know, you'll receive, um, you know, word from family in Somalia that, you know, the crops have failed um, and that they need money. Um, and this is a pretty effective way of helping, um, you know, Somalis in the absence of NGOs. Um, but this time things were different. Um, you know, our family is uh, situated in Gal Gadu's region, which is in the south central portion. Um, and they were talking about hunger, you know, which was uh, quite new. Um, and of course, Somalis, as they always do, pooled their money together and kind of sent it home to family. Um, and it wasn't just Somalis um, who knew that there was an, you know, a famine about to occur. Um, there were early warnings. The international community, particularly international agencies, knew of the potential for a drought as early as August 2010, and it looks like much earlier than that from what you were mentioning. Um, the USAID first published the paper in August of 2010, warning that the weather phenomenon known as La Nina was likely to lead to a decline um, in rainfall during the subsequent two uh, rainy seasons. Um, and several other warnings, and early warnings were by and large ignored. <laughs> Um, news of the famine uh, finally hit international media outlets um, around July of uh, 2011 when the famine was um, declared in six regions um, in Somalia. Um, and even with this knowledge, aid agencies were slow to act, citing concer security concerns in the impacted areas. Um, I had a unique vantage point during the summer because I was working with Save Somali Women and Children, 
which is based in Mogadishu. I was working with UNESCO at the time. Um, and I was also assisting Islamic Relief, um, you know, with their, um, just kind of consulting them. Um, and the head of Islamic Relief, which was um, one of the first international agencies to be in Somali during that time, voices frustration at being in countless meetings with representatives of different agencies um, and just being alone, basically. Many people were citing security concerns. We can't go, we can't go, al-Shabaab, al-Shabaab. And it was literally Islamic Relief and a handful of other Somali organizations which were doing the work. And these organizations, um, probably with the exception of Islamic Relief, lacked the capacity um, and the funds to have um, delivered the amount of aid that was needed uh, to the affected populations. Um, so what were the implications? Right now, all we have are estimates. Um, we really don't know how many um, deaths there were from the famine. Um, but rough estimates are around 25 to 50,000 people um, died. Um, and it will be great to hear the results of your study uh, to see if, um, what the actual number is. Um, Oxfam and Save the Children released their report in early 2012, um, basically stating that aid agencies were too slow to act, which led to the death of thousands. Um, they called it a culture of risk aversion um, amongst um, international NGOs. Um, women and children were, um, as we know, disproportionately impacted by the famine um, and made up most of the drought displaced uh, refugees. A government minister reported that many men were staying put because they feared arrest by pro-government forces uh, for being militants. Uh, so what was the res Somali response? Um, and if I'm speaking too fast, somebody can just put their hand up. I tend to do that. Uh, Somalis in the diaspora responded quickly and forcefully uh, to this famine. Um, you know, as ha has been the history with Somalia, there was, you know, there was a belief that the international community would not come to the assistance of Somalis. So Somalis, you know, are very can-do people and they mobilize amongst themselves to assist their people. Um, the Somali response um, was twofold. There were increased efforts in Somalia by um, Somali diaspora-led NGOs, um, and there were the creation of new campaigns and groups um, which were actually led by Somali youth in the diaspora. So just to speak quickly on the increased efforts of existing organizations, um, Save Somali Women and Children, um, which I was working with, uh, created uh, these uh, dignity kits, which were basically kits which, which, which women could kind of take on the go. You know, when, you, you know, you're fleeing, you don't have time to pick up your you know, food, you know, clothes and whatnot. So they created these little packages which had everything that a Somali woman would need um, and also things for children in there as well. Um, and um, also distributed non-food items in 10 IDP camps in Mogadishu. Um, and um, also um, helped to improve livelihoods of the famine-affected um, households through food voucher programs. Um, and then there, was, um, there were several American, Somali-American NGOs who actually played a pretty big role um, in assisting uh, Somalis. Um, one is called the Adamiga Somali Foundation, um, which is actually headquartered in neighboring Virginia. Um, and they opened feeding centers in um, a region of Somalia called Bula Marer, which houses, um, which is home to um, a marginalized population of Somalis. Opened several feeding centers there. There is the Adar Foundation, which is uh, led by Dr. Saadia um, Ali Aden. Um, she opened uh, feeding centers in Mogadishu. There's Amu, there's the African Future, which actually um, you know, was featured on CNN, MSNBC, and other media outlets. Um, which led food envoys into um, Somalia, into a Somali city which, um, or town which neighbors, um, which is on the border of Kenya and Somalia called Doble, um, and fed hundreds and thousands of people and continue to do that to this day. Um, and also there were a lot of um, you know, youth efforts and campaigns, and this runs counter to what we know about Somali youth. Whenever we hear about Somali youth in the, in the media, it's about these you know, young men who have gone overseas to train with Al-Shabaab or you know, who are you know, inflicting you know, terrorist acts on, this pop in, on you know, US soil. Um, but this was really, um, the youth mobilized in a way that we haven't seen them mobilize ever, um, Somali youth. 
um, there were several websites created which kind of congregated all of the campaigns um, and the fundraising efforts. Um, one was called Feed Somalia, which managed to establish um, fundraising committees from places as diverse as London to Nairobi to San Diego to Toronto, Canada. Um, there was an initiative called Step Up for Somalia, which was created by a family in Calgary. Um, and as you guys probably know, the height of the famine coincided with um, the Islamic month of Ramadan, where you know we're supposed to fast from sunrise to sunset. And these youth actually um, you know, did a walk from Calgary to Edmonton, that's 300 kilometers, in summer heat while they were fasting, which is really impressive, and managed to raise several thousands of dollars. There's the campaign that I'm associated with called End Famine, based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, and they managed to raise thousands by going, um, you know, door to door, um, you know, asking Somalis for money. And there's a really inspiring story of a young child, um, you know, who was um, sick on the day that, you know, that the money was being collected, um, who presented um, the girls affiliated with their group with a huge jar of money. He had been saving up his allowance uh, to go to, um, you know, victims of uh, the famine, and he was only eight years old. <clears throat> okay, and just to conclude with some simple recommendations, um, uh, you know, which Somalis would like to see um, enacted, um, I encourage everyone to understand that the story of Somalia is quite a complex one. What you see in the media is not all of Somalia. Somalis are a very diverse people. It's a very diverse country, and there's a lot going on on any given day, and we're not simply all about terrorism and clanism and warlordism and any other negative ism that you can think of. Um, I would encourage you all to read and learn what Somalis have to say. There are several prolific writers on this issue. Abu Qur Arman is the Somali envoy um, to the United States, and he's written um, quite, quite extensively on um, Somalia. Saadia Ali Adan, who was actually supposed to be here, um, but had a scheduling conflict. And Asha Haji Ilmi, um, who is a world-renowned humanitarian, um, and in 2008, she received the Right to Livelihood Award, which is considered the alternative Nobel Peace Prize. There are a lot of great people in the Somali community, and I encourage you to seek out, you know, videos or, you know, works written by them. Uh, for aid ag agencies, just ensuring that you're consulting local communities um, when devising policies and projects, incorporating the views and voices of local Somalis will greatly improve the efficacy of projects um, in Somalia and even the refugee camps in the neighboring countries. Um, for universities and other organizations, ensuring that you're including Somali voices on discussions um, surrounding Somalia. One of the criticisms um, of our community is that there are several conferences, several talks, several you know, media experts on Somalia and only a fraction of them are actually Somali. So a lot of a lot of what's being said is being said around us, you know, it's being said about us, but not with us. Um, for the, Som the US government, um, there's a rich Somali diaspora here um, with an unrelenting passion to help rebuild their native country, just working to engage these communities um, as they can act as an effective bridge in enacting aid policies which will better the situation of Somalia and Somalis. Um, and just a general point, um, the focus for far too long has been on the reestablishment of peace and security in Somalia. And while this is important, um, humanitarian development has been left to the wayside. Um, and the implications have been quite drastic. Um, similar to the political dual track policy, um, you know, perhaps enacting a dual track policy where US government officials not only engage political actors, but also humanitarian actors. Um, and just to end with a final quote um, by Dr. Saadia Ali Adhan. Um, Dr. Saadia recently wrote um, you know, a piece for the Huffington Post um, about her experience returning to Somalia after 20 years of being away. Um, and I just wanted to read that quote. Um, I could see the silver lining through the bustling markets of both the southwestern region of Geda and Mogadishu, where store after store were packed with all kinds of merchandise. And in the streets of Mogadishu, where beat up roads were jammed with cars, where street vendors sold the tr fresh tropical fruits such as banana, mango, papaya, 
that fill the air with their magical aroma. And we're craftsmen, we're building furniture, such as chairs, beds, dressers, and making futon-like mattresses in the outdoors. However, nothing inspired me more than seeing school children walking back from their schools, chattering their way back to their homes, and university students proudly walking in groups, conversing and trading ideas. This scene has validated to me the notion that Somalia is still a living nation that can dust itself out of the ruins. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Sarad, for that <clears throat> perspective. Um, our final speaker is Andrea Wirtz. Uh, Andrea is a research associate in the Center for Public Health and Human Rights in our Department of Epidemiology. Andrea graduated uh, from IH uh, and has worked for the center since 2008. Her research focuses on the epidemiology of human rights violations and health outcomes among marginalized populations. And her projects currently uh, uh, have her working in Russia, Malawi, Ethiopia, South Africa, and Colombia. But the project she's going to discuss today is a joint effort of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights uh, and the Center for Disaster and Refugee Relief in collaboration with the UN High Commission uh, for Refugees. The focus of the project is to develop a screening tool to identify cases of gender-based violence among conflict-affected populations and refer them for health and protection services. Uh, Andrea's work is currently underway in Ethiopia, predominantly among Somali refugees and will be expanded to other camps in Ethiopia and the region as well as among displaced populations in Colombia. So Andrea, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so as he mentioned, I'm here today to present our, the results of some of our work that's underway in Ethiopia. Um, our work is actually to develop a screening tool to identify gender-based violence among refugees and refer them to health protection and psychosocial services that are, are available to the camps. Um, when I'm speaking about us or our project, I also want to introduce Alex Vu, who's the leader of this project, who's sitting in the back of the room there. And um, we're also working with Nancy Glass in the School of Nursing, Len Rubenstein, who's a human rights lawyer in the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, and Dr. Kiman Fem, who's in the School of Medicine. And we're partnering with the UNHCR, as mentioned. Um, before I start, I want to tell you that Though I'm talking about gender-based violence that we, that we see among Somali refugees and in Ethiopia, gender-based violence is not specific only to this population. Gender-based violence is an issue that's observed worldwide. What I'll do today is actually speak to you about the special issues that, that refugees in Ethiopia are facing and the special needs that they, that they require. Um, so before I start, what I'll do is I'll begin with just an overview of gender-based violence. When we talk about gender-based violence, we typically use the UN definition of gender-based violence and is broadly defined as any harmful act that is perpetrated against a person's will and that is based on socially ascribed uh, differences, gender differences between males and females. And typically when we think about gender-based violence, we think again about violence against women. Um, we think about maybe rape or physical violence, other sexual violence, but it's actually quite a broad definition and it can include anything um, as well as uh, psychological violence, intimate partner violence, female genital mutilation, early marriage, um, and widow inheritance, and a whole number of other types of violence. It also um, includes men and boys as well. We're hearing a lot of emerging evidence that in, in conflict-affected populations, rape is used as a weapon of war even against men, and that it can also include um, genital mutilation and other violent acts. So there's been a big movement um, in the United Nations and a large, a large number of international organizations to really start to address gender-based violence and provide care and services that these people need. Now, it's a little bit difficult to give numbers uh, about gender-based violence. There is, in, in many cases, there's a lack of, of data collection. If there's data collection, there are very heterogeneous in quality or heterogeneous methods that are used. And there's uh, significant underreporting of gender-based violence. And I can um, get into sort of the, the rationale behind the underreporting a little bit later. Um, in 2009, the WHO did come up with some, some very general estimates of, about gender-based violence. 
They suggested that one in three women are sexually abused and one in five experienced rape or attempted rape in their lifetime. These numbers are large, and that's actually including conflict and non-conflict populations. So you can imagine what it is in within a conflict setting in and of itself or in a, or in a camp-based setting or IDP population where people are all crammed in tight quarters. There's a lack of privacy and a lack of uh, structural protections there. They also estimated that 20% of girls and 5 to 10% of boys have experienced sexual abuse in their lifetime. So it's it's pretty stark and um, it's, it's a big issue. Um, we want to address gender-based violence early on because there are a number of poor out health outcomes that can result from uh, gender-based violence. It can lead to immediate trauma. Um, if we address early, we can provide post-exposure -post prophylaxis for cases of rape to prevent HIV infection if uh, PEP is actually available in those settings. Um, and we can also address long-term health sequelae, including trauma, depression, and other interpersonal issues. Um, if left unaddressed, it can damage interpersonal relationships, as I mentioned. It can reduce productivity and can lead to challenges with reintegration of refugees into other communities. Um, as I mentioned, gender-based violence has received a lot of attention recently because of all of these health outcomes. And as organizations become aware of how these interrelate to other health issues and productivity. PEPFAR alone, um, the organization that provides uh, funding for HIV prevention in other countries has provided 155 million alone in the last two years to respond to gender-based violence. So it is gaining increased attention and um, we hope to sort of work with this mo momentum and really increase the access to services. So the purpose of our project is to develop a screening tool that can identify gender-based violence among refugees, something that UNHCR, other international organizations or local organizations can use to confidentially identify someone and then offer them the services that are available, be it health protection or other psychosocial services. It can help them to identify if someone's at risk in a camp and decide if they need to move that person to another camp or to an urban setting. So part of our project, we conducted um, qualitative research, formative research in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, the capital in Ethiopia, and then in the Jijiga camps to the south along the Kenya-Somalia border. And then um, recently we've conducted, we're actually right now conducting the implement implementation phase of the screening tool in um, the Dolo Addo camps, which is along the north um, border with Somalia. So what I'll do is um, I'll talk to you a little bit, oh actually I should say, um, if, if the term screening tool is a little bit confusing, we would sort of liken it to uh, screening of pregnant women for HIV. Um, we typically screen all pregnant women for HIV infection, regardless of whether they think they've been exposed or at some sort of risk for HIV. This would be the same uh, type of method where we would screen all women in the refugee camps in some sort of confidential setting and then decide if they need additional services for any sort of recent experience of gender-based violence. In the United States, we practice this um, for intimate partner violence, and it's become a routine method that's used in hospital and other healthcare settings. Um, so going back to our research, we conducted qualitative research in Addis Ababa and, and um, the Jijiga camps among gender-based violence survivors. Um, the purpose of, the, of these interviews was to actually understand the scope of violence that women experience and so that we could formulate the questions that would really cover the, the breadth of these types of violations and identify someone who's experienced that type of violation. We also wanted to understand the locations and the perpetrators so that we could have questions that would be informative to the service provider so they know how to direct the care for that individual. Following along those lines, we conducted focus group discussions with the service providers in these areas as well so that we could really make sure that our tool is something that would be short and useful to them as well. Okay, so as I continue, I'll provide some of the, the results of this, of this information or of these interviews. Um, we, after we developed the screening tool, we did conduct validation testing among 400 refugees in the Jijiga camps and in Addis Ababa. And then now we're in this final implementation phase in the Dolo Addo camps. So when we spoke with the survivors, we heard a, sort of a wide range of types of violence and vulnerabilities that they're exposed to. Um, and these are not only individual vulnerabilities, but they're social and they're also structural vulnerabilities. 
And a lot of it depends upon where the woman's currently residing or, or her, situ her situation in terms of family and um, her relationships. So um, unlike other conflict settings, we didn't hear so much about rape being used as a weapon of war by armed actors. What we heard about from refugees from Somalia, their experiences within Somalia were typically related to rape um, when women were in transit within New Somalia or from Somalia into Ethiopia or to other um, refugee settings. Um, they were typically raped or abused by a stranger on the street. Um, and it was more common among women who were traveling alone or, or simply with small children who lacked the um, the structural or, or social support and protection that, that might have prevented some sort of uh, violation. In those cases, it was very difficult for women to actually access any sort of care or service because they, d they weren't near a health clinic, they weren't near a physician, um, they may not have had any money to actually receive the services. A few women were lucky enough to have met someone on the road or, or be traveling maybe in a car with someone who had some sort of limited medical training that could, that could help them out. Um, in those cases, it's very important that when people come to the camps then, that they can be identified as a survivor because that's a critical time that they can then be served with, with the various types of um, health and protection services that they need. Um, the, the risks and the vulnerabilities related to transit weren't only in Somalia, they were also in Ethiopia and, and in other countries where women are, are in transit. Um, when we, what we heard from women in transit in Ethiopia were that, oh, I should actually preface it by saying that refugees can move fairly freely between Somalia and Ethiopia. It's a, they're very close to the border. Um, and they can move from the camp um, in Ethiopia to other parts of Ethiopia. Um, or to add as often to try and look to a way to improve their services or to find other services available and improve their situation or find other services available. So we heard from a number of women who had been traveling from the camps to Addis and back um, who had been raped sort of in that process of transit. They would typically go off on their own and um, for example, they might stay in a hotel at one night and the hotel manager will give someone a key to their room because they were paid off to do that. And that woman, at that point in time, cannot receive services either because she doesn't speak the language, she doesn't know where there are health settings or health services available, and it's actually not really her priority. Her other priority is to find, to make it to Addis and find something that she can, you know, maybe somehow improve her life. At that point, I, th I don't think GBV or gender-based violence is really her, her top priority, unfortunately. Um, and I think a lot of the people actually really don't understand the, the long-term health problems that can come from rape or from other type of violence. Um, let's see, so within the camps there were a number of issues as well. I have a picture here to show sort of what the housing structures look like. So this is, this is from Albare camp, and you can see that all of the houses are very, very close together, so there's really no privacy. Um, the houses are sort of wooden structures that are covered by branches or plastic sheeting. So if someone, if a woman's living by herself, it's first of all obvious that she's living by herself, and second of all, if someone wants to break into her house, it's not really much of a challenge. Um, one slight benefit to the close quarters is that your neighbors can hear what's going on fairly well, and they, and in a number of cases, neighbors are the ones who are reporting domestic violence or, or coming to the rescue if someone's being um, violated within their house. That said, it is slightly problematic as well because if something happens within your house, then your neighbors know and most likely everyone else will, will soon know in the camp. So it's a difficult situation in terms of pri serving or providing um, confidential services and, and care for people in, within the camps. Um, we did find that FGM uh, or female genital mutilation, sexual violence, and other physical violence that occur in the camps but they were less likely to be reported because those matters are typically handled within the community themselves, especially if the perpetrator is from the community. It's a, it's a very tough situation because it becomes an issue of he said, she said, and sometimes survivors themselves are blamed for the incident. They may be, um, may be told that they're lying about the incident, and it's a, and it's, it's a very challenging situation for, to resolve. 
Um, the types of sexual violence that, that are reported to service providers are those that occur outside of the camp, typically if a woman is collecting firewood and someone from potentially the host community or some other stranger rapes the person or rapes the child. That's, that's what is actually reported to the health and, serv um, health and protection officers. And speaking about um, raping women and, and the young girls in the, in the camps, age is, as it is in many cases, is a predictor of vulnerability. Um, there's, th we did hear a lot of reports of kidnapping, and it could be kidnapping related to trying to kidnap a child and return them to a family member in Somalia. In some cases, kidnapping was related to rape. And then there were other cases of kidnapping um, for the purposes of, of circumcising a young girl. Um, so these are all issues that sort of uh, are ongoing in the camps. They're very challenging issues to address because of what I mentioned, the fact that it's a very stigmatized issue. Everyone knows each other, and it's a very close community, which has a, a lot of benefits in and of itself. But for a highly stigmatized situation for gender-based violence, it's also um, very limiting because people really are nervous about reporting their, their experiences. This is one of the reasons why we wanted to have this, um, to develop a screening tool. We know that there's, there's a large number of um, women who have experienced gender-based violence, whether it's physical or sexual violence, psychological violence, or who are at risk for it, um, but they just don't come forward. And so by, by working with the local organizations, um, some of the community-based organizations, we want to be able to have them confidentially identify someone and then offer them, just offer them the opportunity for those services. That person has the choice then to say, yes or no, I want these services. And they know that those services are available. So if they say no at that time, they can always come back at another point. So it's a very difficult situation. As I mentioned, gender-based violence is something that's, that's an issue worldwide. Um, in these camps and in the refugee populations, there are very special issues, very special needs. Um, and so when we think about gender-based violence here, we shouldn't just focus on gender-based violence, but we should focus on it in the fact that it's an issue within a very complex issue. As, these, as everyone on the panel has mentioned, these people are also facing famine. They've lost their homes. They've lost their loved one. And so we don't want to force them to prioritize one need over another. We need to figure out a way to, to work with our existing resources and sort of maximize the efficiency of all of them. That's all I want. And so stay tuned for more. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrea. Uh, I just might add that um, this issue, as Andrea said, is uh, widespread. Uh, here in the U.S. as well as around the world, and uh, the Dutch government uh, recently gave um, seven hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred thousand euros, or about a million dollars, to uh, positions for human rights for gender-based violence work in the Eastern Congo and in Kenya. Um, so I'm sure there will be lots of opportunities to collaborate on some of these uh, issues. So the Time now is for you to uh, comment, to ask questions. Uh, if you have a question for a specific member of the panel, just uh, direct that, or if it's a general question, and we have a microphone that will be uh, passed around. Um, I had a question for Steve. I mean, we heard that the food delivered in aid often does not actually reach the people because it gets sort of stolen on route and things like that. How do you, like with the NGOs, how do you deal with that sort of um, situation? The, the case of food getting taken on route is particularly bad in Somalia and it has been in Somalia in the past. Um, and NGOs are not good at it. One of the ways that ICRC addresses the issue is they do the whole thing under contract. In other words, the ICRC doesn't deliver the food. They put out a, a, con a contract for a Somali group to fulfill to take food from international source and deliver it to an IDP camp. So 
they offload all the risk and liability and onto some Somali savvy person who, being Somali, sh seems to have the incentive to know how to work the system. Another way of answering the question is Somalia is probably the one case, or not the one case, it's, it's probably a, a, a good case where I don't care. If the whole region is food deficient, if, if, there's, if there's excess mortality widespread, then if it leaks and, and uh, ends up getting spread a lot to different regions because it is poaching along the way, it doesn't bother me that much. Want to come in? No? Okay. Other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question on sustainability. Um, as as your talk, you, you had like say, when the issue comes up, food pours in, and then it stops. So, is there any consideration from NGOs or from from anyone that you know to address sustainability in countries like Somalia, like maybe? Um, address agriculture or something like that. Because from the example I, I could see, it's like every time there is hunger or famine issues, a lot of aid flows in and then it sort of stops. So is there a sustainability issue? Sure, do you want to? Um, you know, from the Somali perspective, it doesn't seem like many of the projects right now are designed for the long term. Um, Somalis have been stuck in a cycle of aid dependency for over 20 years now. Um, and I would encourage um, aid agencies to look at more, uh, as you said, sustainable projects. Because if, the cap if Somalis had the capacity to feed themselves <clears throat> and to take care of their communities, they'd do it in a heartbeat. Right now, they lack the capacity. And many of these um, projects are quite short term. Um, and we have to be looking more long term. I guess I can add a little bit about sustainability for the health and, and um, protection services in the camps, at least. Um, one thing that we notice is, as, as she mentioned, that there are all short-term projects. People who work in the camps often work there for a short term, for a short amount of time, especially if it's an emergency situation. And there's sort of a, there's some cases a lack of institutional knowledge because people may move out of a position before someone else replaces them. And so traditions or practices or you know, best practices aren't really carried on because that message isn't passed along. Um, so one thing that I think is really important is to, to work with both the large organizations, the international organizations, because they do bring information across contexts and, and knowledge learned and um, experiences gained. Um, but to work with sort of the host communities, the community-based organizations, and groups that are on the ground all the time really train, um, build up their capacity as well because they're the ones who are gonna be there. They're the ones who know the populations. So I think to have that partnership is really important and to, to always remember to focus on that. And there's also the uh, dilemma of international agribusiness with uh, subsidized commodities from the United States, Canada, Australia, um, so that small, uh, farmers throughout sub-Saharan Africa, not just in the Horn of Africa, will often find that um, the global availability of uh, wheat and maize from uh, commodity subsidizing high-income countries distributed through the World Food Program actually undermines the very market that would allow a sustainable local agriculture. Another. Yeah. Yes. So I have uh, one question for Ms. Sheridan and one question actually for our moderator. Um, so for Ms. Sheridan, thank you so much for being here. It's really, I think, very important to have a Somali perspective. I wanted to ask you how you feel about the mention of, um, I think it was Ethiopian and Kenyan troops that have now entered and um, kind of this assumption that Somali people are necessarily supportive of that. Uh, and you know, what the feeling is of Somali people of these other forces that are entering your land and whether what your government is supporting is something that you support as well. Um, and then my other question is for Dr. Lawrence, because I think you probably would want to speak to this the most. Um, 
I feel one thing that was really missing from our discussion here was the effect of climate change and how that's contributed to the whole situation. So I could hear your thoughts. Um, I think you had a slide of um, the three leaders um, and how Somalia is being cut up. Um, I have to word this uh, well. Um, you know, um, the Ethiopian incursion was not looked upon favorably by most Somalis because um, there is a history of Ethiopia's intervention in Somalia. In 2006, um, Ethiopia invaded Somalia um, after the Islamic Courts Union uh, took power. The Islamic Courts Union was a moderate Islamist party um, and had managed to um, introduce stability into the country uh, for the first time at that time in 15 years. Um, and the United States believed that there was a terrorist threat from this organization. Um, so basically helped to eradicate um, the Islamic Courts Union through Ethiopia. Um, so the Ethiopian incursion has not been looked upon favorably for, by Somalis. With regards to the Kenyan, it's more it's more complex um, because there are many who are saying we don't need more countries in Somalia. It's just further complicating the situation. But there all, are also, you know, a minority who are in support of it. You know, um, any there are some who are arguing that anyone who's there to get rid of Al Shabab, it's a good thing. We need as much help as we can get. Um, so I hope that answers your question. So Kenya, it's been more. Um, you know, complex, whereas Ethiopia, you know, 100% most people are like, we don't want them in the country. Uh, the question about climate change <clears throat> uh, is a challenging one because we know from uh, projections based on very good modeling efforts that uh, with uh, climate disruption and climate chaos, we're going to see more extremes of uh, the hydrologic cycle with uh, periods of drought alternating with periods of intense heavy rainfall, flooding, and so on. So if you take a, a region of the world um, that historically, like the Horn of Africa, has, uh, as uh, Sirad mentioned earlier, the, a long uh, history of uh, recurrent uh, periods of drought and crop failure, uh, and then you just exacerbate that situation, um, I think that the uh, outlook really demands a couple of things. First, collective action to take global climate change seriously uh, so that we can begin to mitigate. We're not going to prevent it, but we could start mitigating if there were sufficient political will, especially in the United States. Um, Secondly, uh, a lot of work is being done to try to uh, select cultivars that are going to be more adaptable to uh, conditions of climate change. Uh, so it means continued work on uh, drought-resistant crops. Um, there's, uh, you know, the experience with the uh, Consultative International Group on Agricultural Research, sometimes known as SIGAR, uh, with regard to rice cultivars was very encouraging. There were uh, about 60 different rice research stations around the world, including a number of uh, highland rice experimental uh, projects in the highlands of Ethiopia and the headwaters of the Blue Nile. Um, and over the last couple of decades, there have been cultivars that have been uh, identified that really uh, stand up very well under drought conditions. There are other cultivars that uh, tolerate extremes of going from flooding to drought and so forth. Uh, so I think this is going to become a problem uh, challenging food security in many, many low-income countries, but it's especially exacerbated by the pre-existing background of uh, recurrent drought in the Horn of Africa. Uh, 
I'd like to thank the panel uh, for coming and, to, and addressing us. And I'd also like to thank those of you following on Twitter and watching the live webcast. My question is directed for each of the panelists. Um, and I think Ms. Uh, Surratt actually summarized some of the things that um, the average person can do to improve the situation in Somalia as well as um, uh, change how we think about uh, the country. But could, either, could each of the panelists actually, based on your perspective and your experience, also speak to what the average public health student or average Joe or average citizen um, can do to do their part um, so that they don't feel like the only way that they can express their solidarity is through campaigns like Coney 2012 and other um, funding opportunities. Thank you. <clears throat> Should we start with uh, Andrea? That's a tough one for gender-based violence, <laughs> but I think specifically for public health students, if someone wants to pursue that area of research, as I mentioned, there is a large movement to really address the situation, to sort of think about innovative ways to prevent gender-based violence and innovative ways to respond to it as well and to work with other, um, other programs and projects and really maximize everyone's efficiency when they're working to address this. Um, so in that sense, I think I encourage anyone who's, who's interested to really pursue that field um, you could sort of follow the line of medicine or um, there are even actually fellowships, I believe, focusing on violence as well within the School of Public Health. Um, there's also possibilities to work within humanitarian organizations. For the average person, I think any sort of way to raise awareness in general about um, gender-based violence is important because I think um, globally, it's, it's something that still is stigmatized. Even in the United States, we hear about women and children and men who experience some form of gender-based violence and don't come forward and report. So I think just on a daily basis, sort of thinking about how we view it and, um, you know, if we're aware of it and sharing our awareness and information with others, that's, that's really the, the least we can do, in my opinion. I just want to add a point um, before I get to that point of uh, what I was talking about before. Somalis are very grateful to these international governments that have done so much. Um, Kenya in particular has done a lot you know, for Somalis. Um, in 2011, the, the population of the Dadaab refugee camp almost doubled. Um, I began work in Kenya in April of 2011, and at that time it was around 350,000. By the time I was leaving in December of last year, it was 750,000. You know, so within a short amount of time, that population, which was all in that refugee camp, already housed the largest amount of refugees in the in the world. Um, doubled. And that has really stretched the capacity of Kenya and even Ethiopia and other local regional governments. So the Somali people are very thankful um, to uh, Kenya um, and other countries and also the United States. The United States has done a lot um, for the U.S. I think when Somalis say we want more done, it's because we know of the great history that the U.S. has had in Somalia and we, we know that the U.S. is capable of much more than it's done to date. Um, to address that question, I think the most important thing for the average person is to educate themselves on Somalia. As I mentioned, um, there are many stereotypes and misconceptions um, out there about Somalia. Um, anything you hear in the international media usually points to you know, terrorism, clanism, war, warlordism, piracy, and all of these other negatives. Even on the domestic front, whenever you hear about Somalis, it's quite negative. So educate yourselves on Somalia. Um, and also look at works by Somali writers, you know, Somali speakers, um, because they have a lot you know, to offer in terms of insight. 
Um, some of the were names that I mentioned before were Abu Bakr Arman, Dr. Saadia, Ali Aden, Asha Haji Almi. There are several people who are doing amazing work and will give you a different perspective um, on what Somalis are doing to help their country because there is a perception that Somalis are kind of sitting on their hands while all of these international governments and NGOs do all the work for us, but yet Somalis are doing a lot on a daily basis, and I encourage you all to um, read up on what they're doing and watch videos on it. I hope that answers the question. There's a, <laughs> there's a, a common question people in emergency response get asked, which is, oh, why aren't you addressing root causes? Well, you know, you're wasting your time saving lives because the people are just going to stay in that same dilemma tomorrow and next year, and they're going to end up needing aid. And you should instead be focusing on democracy or you know, long-term economic development or things like that. To which my response has always been, I'm very certain people aren't going to benefit from all those things you're talking about if they're dead tomorrow. Um, and the, my, from a public health point of view, I don't know of any area in human endeavor, any, in any sector, in any walk of life, where you can have more benefit if you measure benefit as disability adjusted life years per dollar spent than an emergency response from just from the very kind of things we were talking about, giving measles in populations that where there's very high mortality. And um, so NGOs do a lot of that, and I think they do a lot of that for good, but they don't necessarily do it consistently. And what where I think you guys can make the biggest difference is in being part of the process of taking this discipline of emergency humanitarian aid, which used to be really ragtag and just a bunch of uh, fly-by-night airplane pilots and cowboys, and make it into a science. And then hold the NGOs, who frankly are very responsive to the public because they depend on the public for their reputations and their money, hold those NGOs accountable um, to that science. In other words, ask NGOs, why did you make that choice here? Why did you make that choice there? What is the evidence base? Our humanitarian aid business is gradually moving into an era of being evidence-based, but the public doesn't really know the right questions to ask, and that's where you guys can make the difference, helping the public analyze all those decisions we're making on a daily basis. Uh, I, I have two questions. First, uh, will all of you who are U.S. citizens raise your right hand? All right, now all of you who have raised your, keep your hand up. Uh, all of you who have your hands raised, if you know the name of your representative in Congress, raise your left hand. So there are a lot of people with just their, oh, maybe a tentative. Now, why do I ask that? Uh, because in addition to what Sarad said about educating ourselves about Somalia and Kenya and Ethiopia. Um, it is our duty as citizens of one of the wealthiest countries in the world that has a disproportionate political influence in international agencies because we pay the largest amount of dues to WHO, to UNICEF, to the World Bank, etc. It's our responsibility as informed citizens to communicate our concerns to our elected representative. And if you don't know the name of your representative, I think I can deduce that you've never written that representative or never telephoned that representative's office. Is that a fair assumption? So um, my representative is John Sarbanes. Um, he hears from me about once a week, or his staff does. Uh, and I get very thoughtful letters. I know that they're produced on a word processor and there's just a little minor tweaking to address the fact that I've identified myself as a public health professional or I've identified myself as a human rights advocate or I've identified myself as a food systems person. So they do get tweaked and modified, but the very fact that members of John Sarbanes' staff say, oh God, we gotta to respond to this guy Lawrence again, means that there's an awareness of these issues, and I have had personal 
conversations with John Sarbanes uh, and with Senator Mikulski and with Senator Cardin uh, since I have lived in Maryland. And this really is important. So become active, be an advocate for good policy with regard to uh, our international position, uh, with regard to our food systems policy and so forth. Um, and the other thing that I would add to what public health students can do, it sort of builds on what uh, uh, Andrea said, um, use your training, use your skill, use your knowledge to continue to close the gaps in our understanding of some of these major threats to human welfare and well-being around the world, uh, and then translate that increased knowledge and awareness into uh, advocacy. We are often a little too shy about speaking out and advocating based on good science and based on good analysis. And that's a unique privilege of people who have studied public health. Yes, you want to? Sorry, sometimes I tend to think scattered. Um, I just wanted to um, add that many of you are probably going to go to work for some of these international NGOs, maybe the United Nations. Um, and as I said, one of the things that is miss one of the things that are missing right now are Somali voices. Uh, many policies are being enacted. Uh, many projects are being developed without the consultation of local communities in Somalia. So really, um, I would encourage you once you get to work for these, some some of these agencies to. Um, educate your, you know, coworkers on the importance of consulting, you know, with the local leaders, the clan elders, you know, the religious leaders, um, the women and the children in the community um, for their voices because affecting, um, you know, trying to affect change in these communities without input from local Somalis is, um, uh, is going to be quite detrimental, I think. Uh, to the efficacy of the programs. So really ensure that local Somali communities are being consulted when you're developing some of these policies and pro programs. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I didn't mean to let off the hook those of you who are not U.S. citizens. You need to know who your parliamentarians and your delegates are as well. And uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for um, the wonderful insights. Um, I have a little question about the, um, the impact of the political situation in Somalia. And there's this common theme that comes up uh, when you try to look at the issues, which is Somalia and Somaliland. And there's sort of like this, um, you know, stratification of the country. I don't know whether um, Syria can speak to these issues a bit as well as um, Steve. You know, based on your experience working there, what do you know about the two? And can you enlighten um, us here as well as uh, um, listeners uh, or viewers on the internet as well? Thank you. Um, on the political front, and I'm not a political person, um, so I'll try to speak to it to the best of my um, knowledge. There is the dual track policy, and for, for those of you who don't know, it's um, engaging um, the transitional federal government um, in Somalia, in the south and central Somalia, and also Somaliland, which is an autonomous region in the north. Um, but I think some in the Somali community would argue that it's been detrimental um, to um, humanitarian assistance because what you have now is what is being called the balkanization of Somalia. Um, whereas 10 years ago it was Somaliland, Puntsland, which is in the, reg the central region um, and the um, south and central government, um, now there are something like, Somalia is being, every, yes, every day there's a, new, there's a new leader, there's a new president of these autonomous states, you know, there's, you know, at last count, I think um, Abukar Arman, who's the Somali envoy, as I mentioned, was mentioning that there's something like 40 leaders in Somalia now, um, and um, this is really complicating the delivery of humanitarian assistance. Um, you know, personally, and I think most Somalis would agree with me, um, you know, the, the Somaliland, the Puntsland, and the TFG was 
you know, um, there were some issues with the engagement of those three communities, but it was, it was working much better than now where you have the U.S. government engaging, you know, some of these um, leaders that are popping up. Um, do you have anything to say? <laughs> so I worked in the Ethiopian refugee camps in the Ethiopia famine in 85, where I worked alongside Tigrayans and Eritreans who were bosom buddies fighting a common cause in the trenches year after year after year against the the, the people they were opposing in Addis Ababa. And then they finally won. And the Eritreans said, great, see you later. And they declared independence. And the Ukrainians were just furious. And um, I, when the Eritrea had voted for independence, I remember huge marches in Washington, D.C., where every Ethiopian who was just, they were so upset about this notion of a, one big nation that all of a sudden it was fragmented. So there's this tendency in any country for people who love their whole country to not be fond of separation. And it's particularly galling to central governments. So why is it that when Somaliland declared their independence that the governments around them didn't recognize their independence because those governments don't want to encourage anybody doing that in their countries. So it's a systemic thing where sovereign governments don't like to see independence movements. So Somaliland, which has been completely had their act together, safe, well demobilized, well organized, is in every possible sense of the word a functioning country in itself, isn't recognized by any other country, any of their neighbors, stupidly, just because they're afraid of what would happen. But just recently, as your questions suggest, even within Somaliland, there's now little breakaway movements. They say, well, if you can do it to Somalia, then we can do it to you. And so there's lots of little breakaway movements all over Somalia. We don't really know where it's headed. It's kind of spooky. Yeah, like, I, just, I just want to give you an indication. I've only been back in the US for um, four or five months. And already, there have been two celebrations for two independent states. One is called Jubaland, another one is called Khatuma. Um, so it just seems like every day there's somebody saying, this is my chunk of land, you know, I'm leader, and um, somehow they're being, they're being engaged, um, which, and I think that's a detriment to Somalia as a whole. Um, we have time for one last question. Okay, hi. Um, that was very, I mean, so far it's been a very enlightening discussion, but I guess some of us have some gaps in our, in our knowledge as we hear all this you're saying. And I guess if you can just speak to some, some things, for example, if you could give us a, a, a quick history of how Somalia came to be this hotbed of warring tribes, or if you like, if you wish, and what's the role of Islam in that whole mix? Uh, what I mean, to, what, I, what I'm asking, basically, I guess, is to say, why? Since I've heard about Somalia, I've never heard of a strong central government. Right? This government seems weak, and I mean, I would assume that if you have famines every year, by now the government should have developed some form of, you know, response or have been being able to have the capacity to respond to the famine. The fact that that hasn't happened cannot be attributed to just aid alone. There's probably some structural weakness in the government. So, just some little background as to Historically, why how Somalia has come from? Uh, I mean, why is the, why is it the way it is right now? What's the history behind all of that? I guess is my question. One way of thinking about it is that Somalia probably has the highest proportion of any country in the world of the population being pastoralist nomads. So if you think about the United States history, if you think about cowboys wandering, there's just something about when the population is mobile that they don't buy into our concept of a stable country with a stable government that, is, that has representative democracy and things like that. Um, another way of thinking about it is because the population is so pastoralist nomad, there hasn't been a lot of industry in the country. So I would say that of all the countries in the world, it may be one of the, the most lagging countries, maybe the most lagging country in having industrial diversity. The country, the, the main job, the main source of livelihood for most Somalis today is about the same as it was for their ancestors a thousand years ago. Very little churn, and so they keep falling further and further behind. They keep watching the rest of the world get better and better, and so it creates grievance, and like many cowboy populations, they're all well armed. So I don't know if you heard me talk about the demobilization program. We didn't use the word disarmament the way we would in most countries in the world where there's conflict, because we just know you can't disarm the Somalis. 
Sarad, do you want to? Your, your question is deserving of about a, uh, a, a one-term course in Somali <laughs> history. So uh, it's a big challenge. But Sarad, why don't you have the last word here? Um, as Steve mentioned, um, you know, the majority of the population is a nomadic um, population. And um, traditionally, you know, whenever it came to food insecurity or, um, you know, other issues, the clan system, um, Somalis have clans, um, served as a safety net, you know. Um, so many were divided into clans. Um, and contrary to popular belief, during um, the Siad Bara government, which was the last government in Somalia, um, he advocated for this notion of Somali Wayne, you know, and he, um, I should backtrack, um, the colonialists, Somalia was divided up many different ways. It was divided up by the British, the Italian, the French, um, and the colonialists um, manipulated the clan system to meet their own needs, to meet their own ends. Um, and in 1969, when the Siad Bara government came in um, to power, one of its um, priorities, one of its goals was to bring everybody together. So he came with this notion of Somali Wayne, we should be one. And um, in the last decade or so of his term, um, one clan started to become more favored than others, which of course caused resentment amongst other clans. Um, and that's where you had the civ Somali Civil War, um, you know, clan other clan leaders kind of rising up against the Siad Bara government. Um, and in the 90s, you had just kind of these warlords affiliated with different clans kind of fighting each other for power of different regions um, of Somalia. And this is what continued until 2005, I might be a little bit fuzzy on the date, um, where Islam came into um, play. Um, and about Islam, I quickly will say that S Somali Islam has always been a very moderate, you know, and I don't like to use moderate, radical in these kind of terms, but it's what most people understand. Somali Islam has traditionally been very, you know, moderate, you know, um, and the, when the Islamic Courts Union came into power, um, they viewed Islam as a unifying force. They had seen what clans had done to the country. Um, and rather than try to unite people, you know, um, that way, they tried to unite them through Islam. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it was working, you know. Um, Somalia had several months of uh, stability, um, you know, under the Islamic Courts Union. Um, and uh, in 2006, the Ethiopian government, of course, invaded and uh, kind of took them out of power. And what you had, Al-Shabaab was basically the fringe element, the fringe radical element of the Islamic Courts Union who kind of broke off from them, created their own party, and unfortunately, um, the implications are with us t today. Um, so in a nutshell, clans and Islam at different times have been manipulated to serve the political ends um, you know, of uh, these different groups. And what people really should understand is that the militant al-Shabaab you know, Islam is foreign to the overwhelming majority of Muslims in this world. Um, it does not represent Somalis traditionally. Um, and all Somalis you know, are against what al-Shabaab has done to the country and how they perverted what um, Islam is. I hope that answers your question. It's a really complex question, and I hope uh, my two-minute answer, yeah. Thanks, Sarad. Well, please join me in thanking our three panelists. This has been really uh, enlightening. <clears throat> and now we're going to uh, hear a word about why some of you have been served a rather meager meal and others a more generous meal. Hi everyone, um, good evening and thank you for attending this event. As you know, it was advertised that we would have a food disparity reception today. And so, um, yes, uh, let me just say a few words about the food. So you were randomly allocated to um, a colored category of food. If you look on the back of your chair, there's a, there's a colored coupon and each color represents a different category of food. 
And so this is to represent the different um, food distribution around the world. And so the four of us are limited to water. One category is um, a bun only. Um, another category is rice and lentils. And then the third category is this big brown bag, which uh, has a lot of food in it. So this is just to show you, so you can discuss with each other as you're enjoying your meal, discuss your reactions and thoughts about this and how it relates to the panel overall. So that's that. Um, and then I would just like to quickly again thank our, our panelists for participating in this event. Thank you, Mr. Hanch, Ms. Sheridan, Ms. Wirtz, and thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for moderating and sharing your expertise and shedding light on this very important issue um, in Somalia um, and all the more? complex issues that you've discussed yeah. today. Yeah, yeah, I Please join me in giving our panelists and moderator another round of applause. Sure. Yeah. I'm interested in the name of the people. And I'd like to thank Indu for having this initiative, the REACH initiative, raising awareness for the crisis in the Horn and bringing the publicity to the school. Um, on behalf of the REACH students and uh, the African Public Health Network, please um, accept a small token of our appreciation that we're going to present to you now. And thank you for your participation again. I'd also like to thank everyone here in Baltimore for attending this event and also to all those who are tuning in on the live stream wow, and cool. those who have been following on Twitter. Um, I'd also like to invite you to the, the rest of our Faces of Africa events. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to, for all those who have come to our event so far. This is our week of events that you've seen around school. And I'd just like to bring your attention to the back of your programs, which has a rundown of the remaining events for the week. So. Tomorrow at lunchtime, Bill Brigger is going to be giving a talk on the future of public health in Africa and addressing the, the dual burden of disease with both infectious disease and non-communicable diseases becoming more of an issue in Africa. So please join us in W2030 for that at lunch tomorrow. And then the long-awaited Friday event to celebrate Africa, we're going to have a fashion show starting off in Summer Hall. And then after that, bring your appetites. We'll have lots of delicious African food. In the ninth, on the ninth floor cafe, and then we'll also transition to an African dance party with music, and that'll progress to an after party off campus, and we'll just be celebrating Africa. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, please, thank you for attending today, and please join us for those events. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors for Faces of Africa Week, the Center for a Livable Future, the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, um, the Gates Institute uh, for Family and Reproductive Health, the Center for Global Health, Student Assembly, Student Life, the Office of Alumni Relations, J.B. Grant International Society, Health and Human Rights Student Group, Anna Beja Society, and the Black Graduate Student Association. Um, so thank you, everyone. <laughs>